Hello and welcome to A Decided Heart Effect, the DH Effect, where we invite you every single week to take action and be inspired to live with a decided heart. I'm Hillary and there's my fabulous co-host Sonia and we are joined by the energetic, positive and amazing Alan Stein Jr. today who has worked with some of the highest performing athletes on the entire planet. People like, I don't know, NBA superstar Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Kobe Bryant. He has been their championship level performance coach. And now he teaches proven strategies to people all over for improvement in organizational performance, effective leadership. Really, how do we get our teams to come together and collaborate? But really, one of the things we loved about him most when we first were introduced to him was that idea of winning mindset, of the rituals, of the way that we show up every day and decide to take action in our own lives. Thank you so much for being with us today, Alan. Oh my goodness, it's my pleasure. This will be a lot of fun. So Alan, I mean, right now you are a keynote speaker, an author, the performance expert, all these amazing things that you do for people beyond the court, beyond the field, like me, because I'm a so I'm, I was raised on the soccer pitch. Where did it all start? You know, we we talk about the decided heart moments or experiences, and there are many in our lives. But the decided heart effect is when we take action. And so curious about your story and where it all started for you to come to this moment in time. Well, it actually, the, the initial seed was planted uh, four decades ago. You know, when I was five years old, I first got introduced to the game of basketball. Uh, my parents signed me up for a recreation league and, and basketball really was my first identifiable passion. And I'm so thankful that, you know, 40 years later, uh, basketball, my first love is still a major pillar in everything that I do. And uh, I say that from a, an immense place of gratitude. I'm thankful that I've been able to make a living and make a life around something that I love. And, you know, uh, when we talk about decisions, um, I, I was given some really tremendous advice as a youngster. Uh, and it, it's really helped me formulate most of the decisions I've made since. And that is um, the key to happiness and fulfillment and high performance and success is finding the intersection between what you love to do, what you're very passionate about, and what you're pretty good at, where your natural talents lie. And when you can find that intersection between what you love and what you're good at, that's going to be your strength zone. And when you can uh, invest time in your strength zone, no matter what that is, you're going to gonna have a, a really high sense of fulfillment. So I'm so thankful that for 40 years now, I've been able to live in that strength zone. Wow. That is so fun. That's Sonia's, Sonia's smiling right now because we, we were introduced this last year to Ikigai. Yes. And so exactly, you're speaking, our, we're like, oh yes, Ikigai, where you, and what you can get paid for, and it helps the world. And you're doing all of those things at one time. And I love the fact that you are really focused on mindset so much. I mean, you've had to have such a powerful mindset yourself to get where you are and the determination. And something that I think would be so helpful for our listeners is here we are in a time frame where we have gone through, gosh, almost a year and a half now of kind of some craziness with the pandemic. And really what we're seeing is the second wave of the pandemic as we're opening, which is the mental health crisis. People who have been off their routines, who have been you know, withdrawn from other people, not having that same connection. And I have a feeling some of the work that you do could be really beneficial. Do you have some words of wisdom or some thoughts or some things that could be helpful to our audience when it comes to what now coming out of, let's call it a slump and into this new maybe season that we have. Oh, most certainly. And, and please know that, you know, uh, that's the reason that I'm here with you guys today is, is I hope to share things that your audience finds valuable uh, and things that they can implement immediately to start making better decisions. And, and with that, um, boy, a, a few things pop in, into mind. First and foremost, uh, everyone needs to give themselves the same grace and compassion that they'd most likely extend a loved one uh, when someone's feeling some challenge. You know, we, we tend to, as human beings, be very critical of ourselves, uh, almost to the point where we self-loathe and beat ourselves up when we make mistakes, or as you just said so perfectly, we find ourselves in a slump. 
And yet we'd be much more compassionate if we were talking to someone else. Uh, so step one is, is learning how to talk to yourself with the same compassion that you'd talk to a loved one. Uh, step two is to own the fact that you are a human being, <laughs> that you are fallible, that you will make mistakes, that you will have some poor decisions, but those things don't need to define you. You know, you, you need to be willing to look in the mirror with some humility and some, some vulnerability and say, it's okay to not be okay. You know, this last year has been incredibly challenging on a variety of fronts for a lot of people. Uh, and I know there's a, a long spectrum um, to, to how much the pandemic has affected each and every individual. Um, but it's okay if this has knocked you off your game a little bit. It's okay if you find yourself in a slump or find yourself demotivated. There's no reason to continue to pile it on with the self-loathing. Uh, just know that in any moment, you can choose to start making different decisions and you can choose to have a different perspective and mindset moving forward. And that choice is 100% up to you. Uh, you know, it's so fascinating that I, I, most of my work revolves around being in the present moment. Uh, and as obvious as that may sound, I find a lot of people tend to gravitate towards the past or the future. Uh, they, they tend to get really distracted by things that have happened in the past or they get really anxious about things that, that may or may not happen in the future. Uh, so I just kind of want to address that as, as part of this. We cannot change the facts of our past. What's happened has happened. And, and this is from childhood all the way up until right now. We can't change the facts of the pandemic. And no amount of wishing, wanting, or hoping can change those things. However, and this is very powerful, we can change our relationship and our perspective to what has happened in the past. So any given you know, occurrence that's in your past, you can choose to reframe that if you want to. Uh, and by doing so, that can actually change how you show up in the present moment. So the facts can't change, but your relationship with the facts can, and that can change uh, uh, how you show up in the present. Same thing with the future. I mean, in theory, the future is 100% hypothetical. None of us can ever go to the future. All we can do is have thoughts about what we think the future will, will hold. And I find it so fascinating that especially in this past year, one of the words that I hear so often from everyone is, you know, well, the future is so uncertain. There's so much uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I know what they mean by that. And I say this with, with love in my heart. The future has always been uncertain. <laughs> it's always been 100% unpredictable. This is not new because of the pandemic. Nothing has changed as far as the future is concerned because of the pandemic, because the future is always hypothetical. So now you have a choice. You can make the assumption that the future is going to be dark. It's going to be negative. It's going to be bad. Or you can make the assumption that the future will be positive. It will be good. Yeah, there'll be silver linings, both of which are 100% hypothetical. So it's up to you which one you choose to believe is actually going to unfold because neither one is real. What's going to happen is going to happen. So th those are two perspectives that I think are really, really important for kind of setting that foundation of getting to a point now where we can start to make decisions in the present moment and actually improve our mental health. Oh, for sure. And, you know, one thing, and that, you know, thank you so much for that wisdom. Um, one thing that you've mentioned in a couple of places and everyone I, to our listeners and viewers, go to his website. We'll show you that and, and you can get... Um, some, some inspiration there. The difference between knowing and acknowledging that and doing. You said there's a difference between knowing and doing, which I think is also related to what you say, the power of repetition. Because I feel like, okay, awesome, Alan. I'm now aware and I know that now, but what do I do next? How do I build up to being ready to respond? Oh, for sure. And I'm glad you brought up, and I actually coined that what's called a performance gap. And it is the gap between what we know we're supposed to do and what we actually do on a daily basis. You know, anyone listening to this right now, um, assuming you are a, a fully functional adult, uh, I'm pretty sure that if I asked you to come up with a list of the healthiest foods that you know of, in 30 to 40 seconds, you could come up with a list of a couple of dozen really healthy foods. I'm sure that if I asked your listeners how much sleep they're supposed to get every night, in a second, they'd shout out a number and many of them would even shout out the same number. And if I ask your listeners, you know, what should you do from a movement standpoint, from an exercise standpoint each week to stay physically fit? 
uh, I'm confident that they'd be able to script out, you know, a few different exercises, do them for this amount of time, this many days of the week. Uh, and the reason I say that is your listeners know what healthy food is, how much sleep they're supposed to get, and how often they're supposed to move their bodies. Uh, but then if I sat down with each of them, one-on-one, -on -one, shoulder to shoulder, eyeball to eyeball, and ask, are you doing those three things consistently? It's going to be either a yes or a no. Uh, and if the answer is yes, these are the foods I eat regularly, that's the amount of sleep I got last night, and these are the types of workouts I do all of the time, that just means when it comes to physical fitness and wellness, they have a very narrow performance gap. They know what they're supposed to do and they do it. That's wonderful. However, if they say no, I don't eat these foods. I can't remember the last time I got that much sleep and I haven't you know, done a workout like that in a long time. I don't say that to make anyone feel bad. And I don't say that to call anyone out. I only do it to shine the light of, of accountability on the fact that they know what they're supposed to do, but they're not doing it. And that's the whole key to my work is learning how to close that gap so that we start executing the things that we know we're supposed to do. And even with that, you know, I want to uh, double down and double click on what I said earlier. Uh, if you find even listening to this right now in the moment, you start to feel some, some shame and some guilt because you're not eating those foods, you're not getting that sleep, and you're not doing those workouts, don't self-loathe. Don't make the problem worse by beating yourself up. Just know that in any given moment, you can change uh, the decisions you're making, and the next meal that you eat, you can choose to eat something healthier. Tonight when you go to bed, you can choose to get more quality sleep. Uh, at any given moment, you can choose to move your body and do something to help your physical fitness. So don't be attached to the past and don't self-loathe over all the things you didn't do. Just know that moving forward, you've got the keys to the car and you're welcome to start at any time. I love that so much because I really do believe, I mean, I, I, I just, it is resonating so much that it is about living a life by design instead of default, right? And we beat ourselves up because we've allowed life to happen to us instead of acting. And, and, and it's funny, you call it a performance gap in our household. We call it an integrity gap, which maybe is a little bit of a, <laughs> but it's oh, like, when, but when you, when you say you're one thing, but you're not practicing who you say you are, there's an integrity gap there. And I love one of the stories in, in your book, Raise Your Game. You tell lots of stories as well that support all of the principles and the things that you have. But one of the stories that you tell, I would love to have you share with the listeners. It's about, it's about a young man. I won't give away the punchline, but a young man who decided that he was going to shoot five, was it five shots he had to make, I think, every day. Do you, do you care? You know what story I'm talking about? <laughs> I, I most certainly do, and I'd be I'd be happy to share. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, back in 2007, I had an opportunity to work the first ever Kobe Bryant Skills Academy, uh, and Nike brought in the top high school and college players from around the country for this intense three-day mini camp with the best player in the world. And in 2007, it was undisputed Kobe was the best player on the planet, uh, and, and one of the college counselors there lacked the physical stature and resume of all of the other college counselors. He was really unknown. But there was something really special about this kid that we as coaches all noticed immediately. Uh, and one of the, the things that stuck out was at the end of the first workout. And keep in mind, we did two workouts per day for three straight days. This was a really intense, grueling NBA caliber training camp. Well, at the end of that first workout, this young man tapped me on the shoulder and said, Coach, will you rebound for me? Because I don't leave the gym until I swish five free throws in a row. Uh, for any of your listeners that have never shot a basketball themselves, let me just tell you guys, that is a really high standard. A swish, by definition, is a perfect shot. Uh, it gets its name from the sound it makes by going nothing but net because it doesn't touch the rim and it doesn't touch the backboard. And this young man wasn't going to leave until he swished five in a row, which means he could swish four in a row. He could hit just a little bit of the rim on the fifth one. It would still go in. He'd still be mathematically perfect. He'd still be five for five. But that wasn't good enough for him, so he'd start over. And if memory serves, it never took him longer than 12 to 15 minutes to swish five in a row. And for anyone wondering, that young man was Stephen Curry, who will go down in history as the greatest shooter that this game has ever seen. And I'm here to tell you, it's not by accident. It's not by luck. It's not even because his dad played in the NBA. It's because Steph's willing to hold himself to unparalleled standards. Uh, and there, there's an important lesson that all of us should pull from that. And that is that the standards we set for ourselves today 
will determine who and where will be tomorrow. And, you know, I, I have told that story no shortage of thousands of times. And every time I tell it, including right now, the hairs on my neck stand up and, and it gives me these tingles uh, because of how impactful that, that mindset is. And, and one of the most important things to pull from that, uh, if I may go on a slight tangent, is to not feel the need to play the comparison game and, and say, well, I need to have the same standards as Steph Curry if I want to be a good basketball player. Or I need to have the same standards as, you know, a, a titan in business if I want to grow my business. Uh, and that's not necessarily true. Each and every one of us needs to figure out what are the appropriate standards that we need to live by in order to start to make the decisions that we need to make to be happy, fulfilled, successful, high performing. You fill in the blank. Whatever it is that you're, you're aiming for, your standards will determine whether or not you get there. And but Ellen, you're such a great example of that because um, you've mentioned that, you know, as a basketball player yourself, you weren't exceptional in terms of the, as a player, yeah. you weren't exceptional and, and you went, you made it to college ball. Awesome. But you said, I wasn't the top of the top, your, but your standards, I don't know what your, you can share what your standards were there, but yet here you are working with the top players of the world, right? In basketball. And I would love for you just to kind of reveal your own personal story on you know, that evolution of, and, and did it take a hard mindset shift for you? Or did you just accept who you were as a basketball player and found your own niche in how you can excel? What was that like? Well, you know, that, and this, the whole concept of self-acceptance and self-actualization and trying not to play the comparison game and doing all of these things, uh, this is a constant evolution. Uh, first and foremost, as much as I enjoy sharing with you guys and your listeners, I, I want to be fully transparent that I don't have any of this stuff on lock, that I have not figured life out. I've got some things that have been working well for me, and I, I've worked hard to make improvement in certain areas, and I'm very thankful of the direction that I'm going, but this will be a lifelong uh, journey. And there have been times in my past where I've done those things very well, and there have been some times in my past where I haven't, uh, and I've had to, to, to learn from both and continue to, to move forward. You know, it's, it's so funny because this is where both standards and playing the comparison game can in fact be a trap. We call it the comparison trap. So in my eyes, I was a mediocre basketball player, um, you know, because I, I went and played at a small school in North Carolina and then my playing days were over. So through my lens and my perspective and my standards, uh, I very much believe I was a mediocre basketball player. But, and, and I don't say this to gloat by any means. I say it for a, a change in perspective. The fact that I was a scholarship basketball player in college, that alone puts me in the upper 1% of anyone that's ever dribbled a basketball. So in my mind, I'm mediocre. In the minds of actual reality and statistics, I was a college basketball player. So that, that puts you in the upper 1%. So a lot of, of how we view ourselves has to do with the measuring stick at which we use. So I, I only want to bring that point up uh, because I know that someone listening to this right now most likely views themselves with the perspective and through a lens of a certain measuring stick. And that's just simply your belief system. And there's nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't make it true. You know, there is a difference between truth and what we all choose to believe in our perspective. And it's, it, for me, it's important to be able to, you know, to constantly look on both sides of that. You know, I, I same thing happened, uh, this, this is recent. So that was something that I looked at maybe 20 years ago. You know, I, I was talking to a friend recently and I know I've gone completely off the rails here and not answered your question, but I'll no, get back on great. track. You're doing great, we're with you, we're with you. <laughs> Last Labor Day, uh, I ran my first ultra marathon, an, an ultra endurance event. Uh, and I'm not an endurance athlete by choice. I, I really don't love running, to be honest with you. Uh, but I was ready to try something different. And I did an event called The Last Man Standing, where uh, there was a group of us and you would run a trail, a, a trail loop that was 4.2 miles. And you had an hour to run it. And when you got to the end each time, whatever you had left underneath that hour was yours to rest. And then they started a new loop every hour on the hour. And the goal was for people to run until there was a last man standing. And I say last man in air quotes because females were a part of it as well. Uh, many of them kicked my butt, by the way. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the, the goal was, you know, to run for me to run in, you know, 51, 52 minutes, have eight or nine minutes to rest and refuel and then start the next lap. 
Well, I ended up doing nine total laps, which was just under 40 miles, which for me was by far a personal record and the furthest that I've ever run. So on that end, uh, I, I, I felt proud. But then it was hard for me not to play the comparison game because I finished in the lower 10% of everyone that was there. The gentleman that run, won ran 34 laps. He ran almost 150 miles. So on my end, for a few seconds, I'm feeling good about setting a new record for me. But then immediately I go over and go, well, nine laps compared to 34 laps. Boy, that's awful. And it's, it's hard not to play that comparison game. Now, thankfully, I have the awareness now to be able to catch myself when I start going down that path. And starting going down that path, and I simply said, look, he's running his race. I'm running mine. I'm proud of the training that I did. I'm proud of what I was able to accomplish today. This was not me versus him. I'm also not only in awe, but really admire what he was able to do. That was his race. And that was terrific. Uh, and it took a good friend of mine to help put that in perspective. Because when I said to him, man, you know, I, I finished in the bottom 10% of this group. And he said, Alan, hold on for a second. What percentage of people do you think even signed up to run that race? Like who, who were the type of people that decided to show up there? So I don't know, probably people that are pretty high performers and go-getters and pretty good runners. And he said, yeah, so you're saying you finished in the bottom 10%, but you're not in the bottom 10% of everybody. You finished in the bottom 10% of the upper 1% that chose to be there in the first place. And, and I know that that math is not anywhere close to accurate, but it was just nice to have him remind me to reframe the fact that on this end, I'm being hard on myself and self-loathing about something that still was an achievement and, and, and a performance that I should be proud of. And it doesn't mean content with. I've already signed up to run it again this Labor Day. And my goal is not to beat the guy that ran 34. My goal is to beat my nine that I did last year and see if I can improve. And that's the only yardstick at which I'll measure myself. So with all of that said, Sonia, I totally forgot what your question was. So you may need to ask it again, but as you can see, I just wanted to go in that direction. No, I think that it was lovely what, where you are. It reminds me of a story that uh, a couple of years ago from my middle son, who was not traditionally, his older brother, pretty athletic. My middle son just was, he's much more interested in video games and things like that, but decided as a sophomore to go out for the cross country and track team. And so he got ready and he's, he, we were sitting outside before his first meet and he's like, I'm going to come in last. I know I'm going to come in last. And he said, I'm going to be the very, very last person. And he was showed And I looked at him and I said, wow, that's such an interesting perspective. And he said, why? I said, well, cause I'm thinking about the fact of there are how many people that have never started the race. I said, you're, you're, you're getting in the race. So to me, I'm not even focused on where you come in. Holy smokes, congratulations for starting. Oh, you know? I love that. Well, you know, and this, this reminds me, well, there's two things. One, you know, I've drastically changed my mindset and my perspective and outlook on how I view these things. And uh, the reason that I shared that was, you know, generally speaking, uh, I'm moving in the right direction. But because I'm human and I'm fallible and I have my moments of weakness and despair, I can still catch myself, you know, reverting back to old patterns or old habits like that. Uh, thankfully, those happen a lot less consistently than they used to, and they don't last uh, for near as long. What I choose to do now, and this would, would hopefully speak to your son as well, is I've learned to detach from outcomes. Sure, I have some goals and, and those can be a North Star, but I really don't spend very much time thinking about my goals. What I do is choose to focus on the process, is on the day-to-day, -day, is on loving the work that I do. Uh, and most importantly, and this is what I would tell your son, is I, I now just focus on my own attitude and my own effort. Those are the two things that I have complete control over. And, and I do believe, you know, congruent with your show's purpose, that your attitude and effort uh, combined together is how you make decisions. So yeah, I'm in control of the decisions that I make. Uh, and, and funny enough, I, I gave a commencement address at a high school a couple years ago. And, and basically the theme of it was, if you want a good life, make good decisions. If you want an <laughs> extraordinary life, then make extraordinary decisions. Uh, and, and with all empathy and compassion, you're going to have a really, really hard life if you make very poor decisions. So these things are all connected. But for me now, I just focus on giving the best effort that I'm capable of as consistently as I can 
and having the best attitude that I can, which I define as how I choose to respond to things that go on in the world. And as long as I'm giving my best attitude or having my best attitude and giving my best effort, then I just let the chips fall where they may. And that's why that night of the last man standing, I was able to sleep very peacefully because I knew that those nine laps and that almost 40 miles was the best I was capable of doing at that time, that I gave my best effort and I had my best attitude. And that gave me a, a sense of inner peace, which is ultimately all that I'm looking for right now. So whether I would tell your son, because I would say the same thing to my own children, whether you come in first, you come in last or anything in between is completely irrelevant. If you can look me in the eye or more importantly, look yourself in the eye and tell me that you gave your best effort and you had your best attitude, that's really all that matters. Yeah, I've termed that, you know, my, so my first um, soccer coach, I'm the best soccer coach I have ever had in my entire soccer career, um, which fell short of college as well, but was my father. And he really focused on what you, everything that you've explained is worthy opponent. So whether you walk on, it's not the outcome at all, but can you walk off feeling like you gave in your all, like you were a worthy opponent to yourself and to the whatever person or team that you play against. And I think this is such a great extension because no, okay, we deal, you know, we're developing as a person, right? We're, you know, working on the mindset, the decision making, but you also have this huge emphasis on people. You said your people, it is the no, most important thing that you can nurture. The stronger your relation, and I'm quoting you <laughs> so, somehow, the stronger your relationships on your team, the more unbeatable you are. So can you speak a little bit more on how you surround yourself with the people um, that may be elevating to you or the reverse may bring you down. How does that work? Yeah, well, you know, when, when you guys talk about the decision-making, that's one of the most decisions that each of us has to make. And it's not a one-time decision. Uh, it's something that we, we basically need to do every single day of our lives and decide, are the people that I'm surrounding myself with, the people that I, I need to surround myself with, uh, to help me continue to grow as a human being, uh, help me to continue to, to have a good attitude and to give a great effort. You know, uh, do these people love me? You know, do they support me? Equally important, do they challenge me and call me out when I'm not living my best self? You know, my goal is to make sure that I insulate myself with people uh, that are going to allow me to continue this trajectory uh, of self-actualization and moving forward. Uh, and, and, uh, to the other side of that is making sure that we're not surrounding ourselves with people that are that are pulling us down. You know, people that uh, don't want what's best for us. They have a hidden agenda or people that get jealous of our success or people that don't care enough to hold us accountable. You know, surrounding yourself with, you know, as they call yes men uh, does nothing to help you continue to grow and improve as well. Uh, and And it's important to realize that, you know, as human beings, we all grow at different rates and we all have different things that we're trying to pursue. So someone that may be a good fit in your, for your inner circle in your 20s may no longer be a good fit in your inner circle in your 30s because you guys have grown in different directions. And that's okay. You know, another thing that falls under mindset and decision making for me is I've worked really hard to not look at the world as right and wrong or good and bad. That, that's not for me to judge. What I try and do is find what things are a good fit for me, you know, is this person a good fit for me? It doesn't mean they're good or bad or that a relationship with them is right or wrong. It's simply with where I'm trying to go, is having this person in my life going to help me get there or is it gonna add friction and make it more difficult? And I, I try and do that with everything, uh, even, even different vantage points or perspectives. You know, I mean, I, I realize our, our country uh, has been incredibly divisive over these past past year in particular, but obviously for a long time. Um, you know, whether you're talking about race relations, you're talking about political affiliations, you're talking about thoughts on a pandemic, you know, to wear a mask or not, to vaccine or not. And definitely don't believe that just because I believe it, it's right and it's good, which then makes other people wrong or bad. I choose not to do that. I simply say, what's a good fit for me? You know, my, my belief system on race relations, is that a good fit for me and the man that I'm trying to become? my thoughts on politics or any of the things having to do with the pandemic. Is this the right fit for me trying to go where I'm trying to go? And that's really how I, I choose to look at everything. But yeah, the, you are the company you keep. So one of the most important decisions we ever have to make is who we choose to have relationships with. I think that it's anchoring to what you said. I mean, I hear what some of the, what I hear coming from you is this combination of confidence, self-discipline, but humility as well. 
in this entire process. And I think that as I'm really sinking in and, and listening to your, your ideas and your choices, you know, it, we have to first spend the time and do the work to connect with who we are and who we want to be. Because that will drive our process, that will drive our routine, that will drive, I mean, the goals will take care of themselves, that will drive who we need to be surrounded by. But you know, this is a hard thing that I, I have three teenagers, and listening to you, there is this sort of mentality sometimes of crabs in a crabs in a barrel, right? Like the crabs in the barrel, when somebody's trying to get out, the, gra- the crab pulls them back down and they can't get out. How do you have some advice or some thoughts, especially for kids as adults, we start to move through our circles with work and everything else. But when they are not in that circle that is pulling them up, but instead pulling them down, how do you start to intentionally surround yourself with people that will help you become the best version of who you are? And that, that is an important decision, decision to make. And the way that I look at kind of the, the, crabs in the bucket. Um, and, and I love, love that analogy. I would love for everyone just to give some thought to who are the four or five people that anytime you talk to them, spend time with them, interact with them, they just fill your bucket. They just light you up. Like every time you have a conversation with them, you leave the conversation and simply feel better about yourself. You feel better about life. You know, I, I've got a whole handful of people um, that, that, that do that for me. And some are people that I can see regularly in person. Others, I have to make the effort to jump on a Zoom call or to make sure that I give them a call. But I make sure that I do that. So once you've decided who the four or five people are that fill your bucket the most, then you need to be very proactive in deciding to invest as much time with those people as you can, you know, that's your choice. So I'm not even saying now, I do believe that if you have somebody that is, that is really not good for you in your life, that it may be in your best interest to cut them out, that it may be in your best interest to break things off. But I recognize that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're younger, you know, in, in your teenage years to, to cut someone out of your circle of friends is, is challenging to do and takes a tremendous amount of, of maturity. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to cut anyone out. You just need to be more proactive and spending time with the people that lift you up. And, and time is finite. We only have so much time. So if I choose to invest my time with these four or five people that really fill my bucket, then there's no time left over for the people that are trying to pull me down. So it just happens by default. So we just need to be very intentional, not only about the things that we do, like our morning and evening routine and the things that fill our buckets physically, mentally, and emotionally, we need to be very intentional in deciding who we want to invest our time with. Uh, so really to answer your question is to do the best you can not to get into a bucket full of crabs. So then you don't have anybody <laughs> pulling you down. Let's make sure you get a, a bucket full of, of something else and then you don't even have to worry about it in the first place. Yeah, where the water is filling and rising you to the top or something. Yeah, sorry, Sonia. Yes. No, um, exactly. Alan, I'm adding you to my. To I'm, Alan, I'm adding you to my bucket. Just FYI. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, um, I would love it. <laughs> I think one reminder as well is within the teams that you have been born into. So family, family is your first team. Um, you know, I always ask yourself, you know, or you know, I ask, I do youth, youth coaching as well. It's you know, how are you, what, what's your contribution? How are you engaged in that? What's your responsibility in this team? And you actually mentioned this too. Are you the type of teammate that you want to play with? Like, yeah. And so there's this, you know, for the teams that we're in, it's not just building the team's outer. Sometimes it's our inner circles where we may not have that choice of team. And we can ask ourselves, how can I, you know, what is my contribution to lifting us up together? And I think that's really important yes. as well. Well, well, let's just say, for example, Sonia, that, that you and I are, are teammates, not by choice, but because we both are working for the same organization. Uh, and that I find that, that, and obviously this is not true, but I find that you're, you're, you're pessimistic. Uh, I, I find that you're very negative, that no matter what happened, you know, so I don't necessarily get to choose that you and I work in cubicles next to each other. That part's not my, well, let me take a step back. In theory, that is a choice because I have the right to leave this company and leave this job at any time that I choose. Yeah. But assuming that I don't want to do that because I do love where I work and I feel like I'm making a meaningful contribution, it's important for me to own the fact that I don't choose how you show up. I don't choose your perspective. I don't choose that, that maybe you're going to bring a lot of negativity and cynicism to everything we're doing. I don't get to choose that part. 
but I absolutely get to choose how I respond to your behavior and how I respond to your actions. And that's where I can have my sense of control. And one of the most important parts for me is removing the trilogy that undermines our performance and our happiness. And that is blaming, complaining, and making excuses. Mm -hmm. Those three things are, I mean, you want to talk about an anchor. Those three things will weigh us down heavily. Mm -hmm. So if I show up every day to my cubicle and you make the choice to be negative and pessimistic and cynical, that's on you. I'm going to choose a different route and I'm going to choose a different path. And while many people might think it's, you know, it, it's understandable to blame, complain, and make excuses, it's not acceptable. Just because something's understandable, it doesn't mean that it's acceptable. So I can either choose to, to get rid of blaming, complaining, and making excuses, even though I have a negative teammate, or I can choose to leave the team completely. Either way, it's up to me. And, and that's what I really think is at the core of a winner's mindset and the core of good decision-making is understanding what things we have control over and what things we don't. And, and most of the things are out of our control. And the learner, the, the sooner you can accept that, and instead of worrying about all of the things going on in the world that you don't control, instead double down and double click on the things that you do have control over, life becomes so much more fluid. Well, it becomes more fluid. By the way, when you said your your trilogy, all I could think of is I'm a victim, I'm a victim, I'm a victim. And like, if you want to get me yeah. like motivated to do something the opposite direction, say that word to me and I'm like, I'm out, you know? So, um, you know, nobody wants to be a victim in their life or, or maybe some people do. Um, those people aren't in my circle. <laughs> so, um, but those are the crabs trying to pull you those down. Are the, those are the crabs trying to pull. But I think you said you get... It, life is more fluid, but I think even more importantly than that, life is more fun and it is more joyful and it is more positive because there's this gamification that can go into what you do. It's like, oh, Joey next door is he, or in the next cu cubicle is, is kind of a negative Ned, but what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna find five opportunities to give him a, an acknowledgement that will make him smile. And if I can make him smile five times today, I'm gonna go home and, and fix myself a drink or whatever else that is. But there's so many, like, I love the idea of, it can be fun if you, you can choose to be like, oh, or, or make it fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's really the definition to me of mental strength goes back to not letting the outer world dictate your inner world. You know, just because Joey wants to show up every day as a negative Ned, I'm not going to let that have an impact on my attitude or my perspective or the way that I show up. You know, now with that said, uh, as I mentioned, I'm still going to have moments of weakness. I'm still going to have, and still to this day, you know, I'll catch myself blaming, complaining, or making an excuse. But where I'm so thankful is now I can catch it in a matter of seconds or minutes. I can kind of give myself a wink and go, Alan, there you go again. This isn't serving you or going to be very helpful. And I can course correct. You know, I used to be the absolute king of making excuses, blaming others and complaining. And, and now I do those things very, very sparingly. And, and to me, that's what's most important. So this still kind of puts a bow tie on what we talked about earlier. If you do catch, you know, uh, if you catch yourself feeling a little down because Joey next door is a negative Ned, don't beat yourself up over it. Catch yourself, have the awareness to know you're doing it. And then in that moment, decide to have a different perspective mm -hmm. or decide to have a different response. And, you know, that's, that's really at the, the core of self-awareness. And self-awareness is nothing that you ever fully arrive at. It's something you have to work on every single day, just like physical fitness. You can't show up, put your flag in the ground and, and announce to the world, I'm physically fit, and then stop eating well, stop sleeping and stop working out because then you no longer will be. It's the same thing with self-awareness. I can't come on your show right now and say, hey, everyone, I'm self-aware because if I stop doing the work that, that's required, I'll no longer be self-aware and I'll be riddled with blind spots. And self-awareness is something that just ebbs and flows. You know, there's some days I'm much more in tune with the universe and much more aware than other days. There's some other days that I've got a whole handful of, of, of blind spots, but that's when I'm so thankful to have surrounded myself with people that can help me see them. So to me, the goal is just continually trying to make progress. It's the intention and the effort to make progress. We're not going to improve every single day of our lives, but we can aim to. We can have the intention to heighten these different things every single day. And generally speaking, even though the line will ebb and flow a little bit, as long as that ramp 
is slowly moving up. As long as that grade is slowly moving towards the person that, that you're, you're trying to become, then, then I think things will certainly work out. Well, I think that is a fantastic way to summarize um, this conversation. Alan, the world needs your voice. <laughs> like, well, continue, preach it, share your wisdom. And everyone, you know, we're going to have all the links um, on all our handles, but you can catch Alan on alansteinjr.com. I think now we're all inspired to go get your book, Raise Your Game, and, you know, High Performance Secrets from the Best of the Best. And so more stories like what Hillary found will be in there. So okay. continue the conversation with Alan, everyone. Alan, we are just so inspired by your words and wisdom. Thank you so much. You, again, I'm, you know, making the commitment. Thank you for being in my bucket. <laughs> we'll be reaching out to you. Um, everyone, don't forget, please subscribe to DH Effect, our YouTube channel. We've got some amazing conversations like this continually happy happening. Um, we also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And we are on all the podcast platforms that you listen to. For now, for today, stay present, right guys? Stay present, hold on to this, reflect what is it that I'm gonna to decide today? And we do hope that after today's conversation, you will have the courage to live with a decided heart. Thanks everybody.